Hello there, it's Terry Sweeney with Light Reading. I'm joined now in this conversation about the future of data centers by Danny McGinnis, Senior Director of Marketing for Cisco. Uh, I don't need to tell you we're living in tumultuous times or interesting times at the very least. Um, all of this is certainly having uh, an effect uh, on how we build and manage data centers going forward. Talk about what you see as the top trend that's really reshaping the, the shape of data centers themselves. It's interesting. So you are right. We, we are living in some uh, tumultuous and, and very, uh, you know, change uh, prominent time. You know, I'd say there's a lot of little pockets of things changing. I mean, we're seeing this movement to public cloud. We're seeing this adoption of, I should really say, not moving to public cloud, but more of an adoption of a of a true hybrid cloud. We're also seeing, also seeing a lot change with microservices and the way applications themselves are being built. Sure. But specifically when we look at data centers, I think we're seeing just this push around automation. We, we've been seeing it, it's been fairly constant, but over the last six months or so, it has just escalated to a level where people really, really are feeling the pain, right? Budgets are being decreased, um, people are managing workloads and, and data centers from remote environments and, and the ones that maybe were a little bit behind the eight ball are, are, are playing catch up and others are just trying to take advantage of, of the technology and really, really um, infiltrate or, or instantiate more and more uh, network automation to, okay. to make it move fast, be more nimble, et cetera. Is it possible to tease out the, 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 the work from home requirement from um, I'll just call it a changing business environment in terms of spending, revenues, the, the, the business aspects that, that often impact um, IT projects and uh, how they implement various applications and telecom services. Well, I, I do think, you know, like all things, we, we, things are cyclical and we see shifts. And, and yeah, certainly, I mean, someone that has a large campus environment or a lot of users, they, they were very much worried about those users. But I'd say that that was the first quarter or so of this. There was this, okay, is my work from home environment robust enough? Can I get my users up and running? I mean, look, I work for Cisco. I think we are a great example of what do we do with tens of thousands of users that weren't working from home constantly. They had the ability to, but right. they weren't working from home constantly to how do we support them? But now you see the shift happening. Okay, we caught up there. Now we have to get our, our workload. So I kind of called that like workforce resiliency. Now we need to get our workload or our application resiliency taken care of. I mean, that's a big underlying concept is, is what do we do about keeping our business up and running and resilient? And clearly digital transformation is at the forefront of, of all of this. Um, intent-based networking expand software-defined networking to accommodate new business needs and requirements. Um, what's your perspective on this? And can you talk a bit about how uh, something like intent-based networking will impact data centers? I, yeah, it's a great question. I, and I know, um, like a lot of things in our industry, like SDN was six years ago, it's kind of this hype cycle that goes around where some of these newer acronyms or solutions, you know, how relevant are they? The way sure, that, sure. that I kind of define intent-based networking is we're really taking automation to full life cycle. So if you think about the way most, I, I, I've been a network engineer for the first half of my career and so lived on the customer side implementing these things. And network automation was something that was near and dear to my heart. Frankly, it's not to everyone though. I mean, it's, there, is a, there is a cultural shift that has to happen. We've seen this in the way our DevOps teams and our application developers work. Sure, and now sure. I think you're seeing, you're kind of playing catch up in the network world where they're like, okay, well, we need to do that too. I mean, in order to keep, the, keep up with the pace of the business and be able to support the engineers. Um, in fact, this is why public cloud became so popular, right? It wasn't necessarily public cloud, it was the operating model that was shifting. And so what I think you're seeing with IBM fulfill is, is taking the entire life cycle of IT from day zero all the way through day two or day N and being able to automate at every 
piece of that along the way. And so if I were to break that down a little bit, you know, from an automation, it takes something as simple as a change. The, there's really three parts to a change. There's the work we do in advance of the change that could be in yeah. weeks leading up to it, depending on how complex it may be. There's the change window itself, you know, Saturday morning at 2 a.m. And then there's all of the work we do to validate the change to make sure that we didn't break anything and the business is going to be back up and running first thing come Monday morning or whenever we come back and, you know, need to be back up. And so from an automation perspective as an industry, this isn't even a Cisco thing. We were really good, you know, whether it be third party tools like Ansible and Chef and Puppet or if it was off the shelf tools like ACI or DCNM. They were really good at automating the change itself. Like, yes, we can instantiate new changes. But not until about a year ago where, where the problems really starting to shift or the solution was really starting to shift to, okay, how do we save time prior to the change? How can we model the environment in mathematical modes? I can tell you everything that's happening. So if I implemented this, what would it actually do when it went production? Oh, these routes are going to be blocked or lost. Okay. So, so we get it, kind of get the picture there. And then the same thing with post, being able to understand, hey, I've just made this change. Uh, these interfaces are no longer up or these servers are no longer accessible. And they were prior to, did you, are you willing to accept that? Is that did, was that happen intentionally? And so now you're starting to see more and more tools very heavily focused on the entire lifecycle IT. And that's really what we mean when we say about IBN. So, you know, getting all the telemetry data at the infrastructure level, then being able to correlate that from, from beginning to end. Changing gears slightly, um, in March, more than half of the U.S. workforce uh, was ordered to work from home. Um, hmm. And curious from your perspective, if you see the work from home trend continuing, and if so, what are companies going to need to do to continue to adapt to this this new paradigm for enterprise networking? I do I do see the trend continuing. I I, I don't think that there's any significant event in the near future that's going to change that. And in fact, you've seen a lot of big Silicon Valley companies come out and say, we're already pushing well into next year. And some even mentioning that this is the new normal, at least for a significant portion of their workforce. I think what this ultimately does for us that are in IT um, is it, it provides, I'm going to have to have both. Like we already had an on-campus environment. We have now shifted to provide a more robust work from home environment. And I think for the foreseeable future, we will have to have a hybrid environment where we support both infrastructure or both operating models equally. Okay. Well, we typically favored one or the other. Do you see customers continuing to modify their data center investments to um, accommodate to the, the, the impacts and the, the, the ways that COVID is requiring us to operate? I do. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's a big area. So when we look at every, every industry and vertical is affected very differently by this. And there's, there's very cyclical nature to what their specific business perhaps needs or is able to afford when we look at investments. But I think the question you're asking is really around generally, what are we doing from like an operations standpoint? And, and I think that's ties right into your first question in that this i think was if if anything a little bit of a realization of how important automation is how important business resiliency overall is and i think that is what you're seeing so the the actual uh dependency on how much infrastructure you need that's very specific to to your business i mean if you're if you're netflix or disney plus your business exploded during this or that's amazon right. You know, if you ran a cruise line, it slowed down. But I don't think it changes the operating model in that being able to be up your digital storefront is more important than ever. So the, the, the uptime, the agility to support your developers that are actually trying to shift their business model. A lot of companies are trying to rapidly shift their business model to because of a changed buying center. And the slower that IT, or, or I should say the faster that IT can respond to that is an enabler for that business or a competitive edge for that business. 
And so I think that's where the every CIO is thinking, how can I be faster? How can I provide better uptime? How can I be more resilient? That's top of mind. And hence, there's a lot of investments in uh, software and, and tooling to help support that. Danny, it sounds like lots of new requirements from customers, and Cisco is always really quick to respond to those new requirements. Tell us about some of the products that we'll see coming down the pike in the next year, year and a half. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure thing, Terry. So I think um, I think for us, you know, the way I think about data center, and, and clearly the, the stacks for technology are getting more and more complex with so many, you know, different what used to be siloed functions all coming together. But I think when, I, when I'm talking to a potential customer or our current customers, I really try and look at the data center in three logical uh, elements or layers. The first would be the infrastructure layer. For us, that's the Nexus 9K. Uh, the big advancement there is what's happening in 400 gig when we look at it from a speeds and feed standpoint. So we just announced our 26 terabit ASIC uh, which is unbelievable. I mean, you want to feel old, it makes you feel old, right? Um, and the other big piece that's happening there is the telemetry data, you know, being able to get the analytics and telemetry from the wire in real time, every single packet, and then be able to pass that up to some of the more advanced automation tools. So that's the infrastructure. The, the second, you'll see plenty more line cards with bigger port densities. I, I'm amazed every time I see, you know, the new announcements. The second piece, the middle layer, is really kind of how we started the conversation around just your, your basic automation. Let's think day zero and day one. For us, that's ACI or and or DCNM, and we bring that all together with multi-site orchestration. The key at this layer is really, I would say, trying to make your on-prem and your off-prem public cloud, bare metal cloud, or even your remote edge environments look, act, and feel like a single entity. So we're talking about unified automation, unified security policy, application policy, all being orchestrated through a single pane of glass. And so we've, we've really done a lot with Multisite Orchestrator to be able to manage both ACI and DCNM managed fabrics uh, through that single tool and federate the management plane, control planes of both. And then lastly, I look at it from a day two ops perspective, and this is really where I tied in that full life cycle automation. So how do we look beyond just maybe that change or simple automation and think, how do I keep the network up and running? How do I really bring in the intent, manage the intent or assure, and this is the keystone of intent-based networking, how do I assure the intent of the network after day zero or day one? And so with that, um, we, we recently announced earlier this year our, our in full assurance and insight suite, which is, and, and also talked about Nexus dashboard, which is a single portal for pretty much all of your operational tools. And now this gives us the ability to truly look at proactive anomaly detection, compliance, remediation, more advanced change management, things like that, to really help meet all those need, all those things that we just talked about. And, the last few minutes. So uh, I highly encourage customers to, to take a look at some of these tools coming out. It's 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 amazing what we can what we can do. Good stuff, Danny. I mean that's a really helpful filter to to view this this changing landscape in. Um, we've we've come to the end here. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your comments. Uh, you're welcome, Terry. Thank you very much for the time and uh, always great talking to you.